and welcome to the first in our Digit Debate series. Um, my name is Esme Terry, I'm a Digit Research Fellow at the University of Leeds. Um, most of you will know, um, some of you might not, Digit was launched earlier this year um, with a, an £8 million grant from the ESRC, um, exploring digital futures at work um, from the perspective of employees, employers, governments and stakeholders. Um, this is the first event in our newly launched Digit Debate series, which aims to open up conversations about digital futures at work for academics, policymakers and industry professionals alike. Um, I'm delighted today to introduce David Hesmontalsh, um, who is Professor of Media, Music and Culture at the University of Leeds. Um, David's a prominent academic in his field, um, several books published on um, creative labour and um, the cultural and media industries. And much of David's work has focused on the work of musicians, which is what he's here today to talk to us about um, in relation to his recently published paper, Is Music Streaming Bad for Musicians? Um, problems of Evidence and Argument. So um, very pleased to hand over to David um, for what promises to be a very interesting talk. Here's what I want to do today. I want to discuss some uh, recent debates and controversies about the difficulties that musicians face in making sustainable livings. And I want to put these in the context of recent changes in the music industries that many people would see as having been brought about by digitalization and the internet. And I want to indicate some problems in how uh, the debates and controversies have been conducted and what questions we might really ask, what state of things. Let me start off by summarizing some of the things we know about work in the cultural industries. Workers in the cultural industries tend to be self-employed or freelance. They often have irregular employment, work on short-term contracts with little job protection, they often have multiple jobs with uncertain career prospects. They're often younger than in other sectors. There are highly unequal financial rewards and perhaps not unrelatedly, they're unevenly unionized. Cultural labor is often treated in policy discourse and elsewhere as though it's not real work, as in the well-known case of Fatima who uh, in the government's uh, drive to um, uh, encourage more people to work in cyber security last year uh, was uh, displayed as, as making the error of their ways in pursuing career in dance. I think there are some distinctive and interesting features of musical labour and indeed of music as a particular type of cultural labour. Music uh, historically has special connections to notions of freedom, self-expression, community and identity. You see a particularly strong version of the tensions between creativity and commerce that uh, uh, occur across the cultural industries, often tied to so-called romantic notions of autonomy. You see particularly marked inequalities with massive financial rewards for the most successful musicians, and with a very long tail of insecure workers, including uh, amateurs as well. Amateurs participate in, in musical culture. So now let me give you some uh, brief but vital context about how the music industries have changed. As most people will be aware, the music industries were in crisis from around 2000. And that's usually said to be a result of the digitalization of culture, uh, digitalization in general, the internet. Um, let me uh, talk, talk through um, the decline here. These are global recorded music industry revenues from 2001 to 2018. You'll see steep decline from 2001 down to 2014 and then recovery from 2014 to 2018. And that recovery has continued even into the, um, into the year of the COVID pandemic. The um, red area of the graph 
refers to sales from CDs and other so-called physical artifacts. So you can see that what was really leading to the decline in revenue was a collapse in uh, the sales of CDs. And you'll see, looking at the uh, lighter blue segment of the graph in the bottom right, uh, that refers to streaming. It, around 2012, streaming is bringing in about a billion dollars. By 2018, it's bringing in nearly $9 billion a year. So you can see that streaming has brought about the recovery of global recorded music industry revenues. So what are music streaming services? They're services that offer on-demand access, either by internet or by mobile, to large, actually vast catalogues of music, or to YouTube. They're paid for either by subscription or by advertising or some hybrid of the two in the case of Spotify. Many of you will be familiar with the big names uh, in Europe and the Americas. The dominant companies are Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon streaming services and uh, YouTube. As a result of the rise of streaming, we now have a very different system of musical production and consumption from that of the late 20th century. And this is actually vital for understanding the issues concerning uh, musicians' earnings. So let me just draw the contrast for you. I would say that the late 20th century system was centered on retail, media, copyright, and contract. Most revenue, as we've already seen, was generated by, was generated by sales of CDs and so on in shops, in retail. But media were vital, radio especially, but also television, cinema and games provide crucial exposure and publicity, plus some supplementary income from rights. In this system, musicians assign their recording rights to record companies and their song rights to music publishers. It's essential to understand, for understanding um, the music business, that there are two different kinds of rights, one for recordings and one for songs. So there are maybe 500 different recordings of the song Wonderwall, uh, so 500 different recording copyrights, but only one song copyright. These rights holders, the record companies and the music publishers collect revenues, and pay royalties to musicians, only a small proportion of musicians gain entry to this recorded music industry system. The new system that now prevails after the crisis from 2015 onwards is based on streaming media and copyright and contracts. So some continuity there, most revenue as we've seen, is now generated by streaming subscriptions and advertising. Media still matter, radio, television, video, etc., are important, but music streaming services have largely replaced retail. The shops are disappearing, not entirely, thank God. Recording and song rights are still owned by recording and publishing companies. Rights holders, the record companies and publishing companies now license their recordings and songs to music streaming services. And then uh, uh, the, music, the music streaming services pay the rights holders as part of those licensing agreements. And the rights holders then pay musicians who are contracted to them. So it's vital to, to, to present this as simply as possible. It's vital to understand that at the heart of the new system are two major entities in a state of mutual interdependence. On the left, the rights holders, as I've said, record companies and music companies, the companies that own the songs. The three big record companies are Universal, Sony and Warner at the top, and there are also a host of many, many so-called independent record companies, which really just means smaller record companies that aren't majors. On the right, you see the music stream 
streaming services, Tencent services, China, and smaller companies such as Tidal. The music streaming services can't survive without the rights holders who license to them. The rights holders control the music. You can't have the music streaming services without the music. Music streaming services don't finance and commission recordings. The record companies do that. The music streaming services don't have any musician, musicians contracted to them. That's the record companies and the publishing companies for songs. Music streaming services do not own the rights to music. All this has largely restored the power of the large record companies that seem to be eroding during the crisis of the first 15 years of the century. One tiny exception to the ownership of rights is that uh, companies like Spotify are now investing a lot of money in podcasts. They do control uh, uh, some of the rights to podcasts. That's their attempt to get their own copyrights. However, there's a vital aspect of all this system that needs to be taken into account as a, 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 an important change. And that's the increasing ability of musicians to distribute their work, a range of distributors and so-called label services, and even to retain ownership of the rights to their own recordings and songs. And it's common to hear uh, such musicians referred to as DIY musicians or Unsigned is used in many different ways in the music industry. DIY musicians makes it sound as though, um, you know, these are small scale local musicians, se uh, semi professional musicians going round the record company, record companies and publishers, or actually quite big artists, such as this man, uh, Chance the Rapper who uh, is what, an example of a musician who's retained his own ownership. Now, um, that's my summary of the new system, how it differs from, from the 20th century one. So now let's go to the controversies over streaming services and musicians. These begin from around the time that music streaming services emerge, around 2008-9, intensifying around 2012-14. You'll see this um, uh, uh, from The Guardian from 2013, Spotify versus musicians. That puts it pretty clearly in terms of where the public debate was at. One of the major forms that critique has taken has been complaints about low so-called per stream rates, as in this diagram, which purports to compare these rates for Amazon, Apple, YouTube and Spotify. If you look at the Spotify example here, uh, the diagram claims that um, it, each stream generates 0 0.0038 cents um, for the rights holders. And of course, the musicians only get a part of that. So um, this seems a very striking statistic. Um, that seems very unfair and uh, uh, was often compared with what musicians would get from a sale of a CD. However, this is a prime example of some of the conclusions around uh, the debates about uh, musicians and income from streaming, as I'll explain shortly. Um, uh, of these debates and concerns about musicians and streaming with a, uh, a number of prominent campaigns, for example, the hashtag broken record campaign and the keep music alive campaigns in the UK. These reflect the uh, long-standing concerns that I've just mentioned, but have been given new urgency and impetus by the massive collapse in live music income. For musicians during the COVID pandemic. This has all culminated in the launch of a parliamentary inquiry in October of the year by the House Common Select Committee for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, which is still open. 
I think we can identify two major claims that have emerged from these debates on the part of critics of the new system centered on streaming. The first is that the new recorded music system is unfair, even more unfair in the eyes of its critics than the previous system. The claim is that it's harder for musicians to make a living than before. And a second claim is that the new system reinforces the domination of the major record companies and the elite group of musical superstars closely associated with them. So questions that might arise from these claims is whether they're valid, uh, to what extent um, are things actually getting worse for musicians. In order to address those and other questions, I need to explain a little bit how streaming earnings actually work. I've Let's go into a little bit more detail here. First of all, music streaming services collect revenue from users. They collect their subscriptions and some advertising. And they, they keep a commission, they pay some tax, and they distribute roughly 70% to rights holders, the record companies and music publishers. About 52% goes to the record companies, about 18% to the owners of the song copyrights. Record companies and publishers then pay royalties to recording artists and songwriters, the terms specified in the contract. Now, all this is done, and this is crucial, on a pro rata system. Rights holders are paid according to the proportion of total streams achieved in a given period. So to give a simplified example, if users stream 300 billion times on Spotify in September and track X gets streamed 30 million times in that same period, well, you'll have to believe me that 30 million is one ten thousandth of 300 billion. So Spotify would pay one ten thousandth of the September pot to the owners the rights for track X, as I've already explained, split between the recording rights and the song rights. What this actually means is that there is no such thing as a per stream rate. The per stream rate, so-called, is merely an analytical construct calculated in retrospect rather than an actual practice. Spotify don't say, right, we are going to pay zero rights holders. That's not how it works. It works in the way I've just explained. And this is deceptive because per stream rates will actually tend to go down if people stream more because individual tracks will get a smaller proportion. But overall musician income might well rise if people stream more, <clears throat> excuse me, because more users mean more subscriptions and maybe more advertising revenue. So this means the complaints about per stream rates often misrepresent the problem and how the system works, which is not to say that the system is without its problems, as I'll come back to. So the most, instead what we need to do is look at the actual factors that determine musician income. Uh, the first factor is total streaming revenue, how much money is coming to the streaming services. And that's determined by number of subscribers, by advertising revenue, and by the cost of the subscription, which in Britain for Spotify and other services is £9.99 per month, and I'm sure uh, many of you are, are, are paying that amount or, or, um, or more for a family a subscription and so on. Um, the second factor that we need to consider is that um, it's the proportion of total streams achieved by a track that matters, not the number of streams. So you get a lot of 
uh, contributions to the debate saying, well, um, I, I got 10 million streams and I only got a re relatively small amount of money. You know, a lot of this is about the politics of, of numbers, of quantities, but it can actually be, well, and usually will be a, a very small proportion of the total pot. And that's because of the abundance of tracks available. What we're dealing with here is a digital platform system of abundance for consumers. I'll come back to that. A third vital factor to consider is the musicians' contracts with the rights holders. And this, as you have hopefully gathered from my earlier explanation, is totally separate from music streaming services. Music streaming services have no uh, dealing with that whatsoever. The standard rate for recording contracts is generally reckoned now to be around 15 to 20 percent, which is considerably higher actually than in previous eras, where um, historically 5 percent of the suggested retail price for much of American music history was the, the standard. Uh, and even prominent artists wouldn't get much more than that. And there were many examples of underpayment and non-payment, and as a result of racism, that problem disproportionately affected black musicians. It's 50% for publishing contracts, which sounds much more generous and is, but remember, less money goes to the uh, publishing side, to the song rights side of the business. So here's the, um, the the center of the talk really, um, I want to raise five questions that might therefore uh, be asked, missing word there. Um, I know the only questions we want to ask today are uh, things like how do polling organizations continue to get So uh, these are the questions that we might ask if we're interested, uh, as I hope you are, in the question of uh, fairness and justice for musicians. It's not about per stream rates, but first of all, are consumers paying uh, enough for streaming? Does the £9.99 or €9.99 Euros in Europe, $9.99 in the States, Accurately, accurately reflect the value we might attribute to this huge abundance of music that uh, is now available to us. And it seems to me that this may be a, a very interesting instance of how uh, the digital creates situations in which uh, consumers have um, great choice and convenience, but producers, i.e. workers, potentially suffer, maybe. Second question is, are royalty rates high? As I've previously, they've gone up spot over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, this really would have probably the biggest influence on what musicians receive. Record companies uh, argue in response to demands for higher royalty rates that they take on very high levels of risk in signing artists and investing in their career development in what is a, a highly risky industry, particularly for smaller independent companies who can't spread the risk a, a, across a, a larger repertoire as the majors can. The third question is, what is the distribution of revenue across musicians? Remember, I noted earlier the very marked disparities in income between the most successful artists and the, the less successful. As superstar economics, uh, others might refer to uh, winner-take-all effects in cultural markets. And this is where there's a real problem of uh, evidence, a real lack of, uh, of, of evidence. Here's an example, though, of a rare attempt to gather and analyse evidence a music industry consultant, Mark Mulligan. This um, chart shows that between 2000 and 2013, 77% of revenues from uh, recorded music um, went to the top 1% of artists, the so-called superstar artists. 
the remaining 99% of musicians received only 23%. And uh, one of Mulligan's findings in this research was that digitalization had made things worse. It had concentrated the revenue more in the top 1% rather than less as some digital, digital optimists had hoped. A fourth question we need to ask is, how many musicians can make a sustainable living out of music now? And how does this compare with the old system? Um, of course, we need to think about definitions of sustainable living, living wage, and so on. Uh, it's true that many successful artists who earn money during the previous system based on CD, now CDs now make rather little money compared with what they did when they were selling CDs. But remember, I pointed out earlier that we've now seen the rise of these dis digital distributors and label services that um, it seems positions are now involved in the system in some form, earning money from recorded music. A fifth question is, how is musical success determined and by whom? The, um, uh, the, the, the issue here really is the uh, new power of this new entity, music streaming services. Yes. The abundance of music that's now available means that publicity and marketing have become more important than ever before. Publicity and marketing are absolutely crucial to the dynamics of the cultural industries in general, but arguably they've become even more important in this era of abundance where it's almost impossible to find your way through, through it without guidance. And exposure, i.e. The terms increasingly used for, for exposure, I think words like discovery and prominence, uh, these depend on the music streaming services, on their interfaces, on their algorithmic recommendation systems, and on their playlists, um, which are uh, comprised of a mixture of, uh, of human curation and algorithmic curation. I'm not talking here about listener generated playlists such as this one that I made two years ago which I've put on here in order to demonstrate my impeccable musical taste. Instead I'm talking about curated playlists uh, made by the music streaming services themselves often based on genre such as this many many subscribers followers you can see there are 10 million fo plus followers there uh, and which has a, a great influence on success in uh, the, the rap genre and beyond, because rap is, of course, one of the most popular genres in the world at the moment. So getting your track high up on that list, rap caviar, becomes like gold, like getting played on primetime radio or television um, in the previous system. Okay. I just want to make some uh, comments in uh, the last five minutes about um, how we might make sense of, uh, of the debates and, and evidence. I'm afraid I'm not going to be talking much about solutions uh, to, to uh, the, the problems surrounding musicians and streaming, uh, because uh, at the moment, anybody uh, purporting to be able to offer solutions, uh, you, uh, you, you might want to uh, 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 think of them with some scepticism um, because this is a very complex situation. But what I want to say is that many of the contributions to debates often simplify what happens in the, in the music industries. And that's understandable. It is a complex system, in particular, the system of rights, of copyright and rights ownership and how the money is paid is very difficult to get your head round. What's more, uh, the, the different sides, and there are more than two sides in this, um, have come to take really quite entrenched positions. 
However, I think what's happened in this situation for all the problems, we now have unprecedented public interest in the income and working conditions. Streaming seems to have, the debates about streaming seem to have been part of an increasing recognition that music is real work. You know, that um, Fatima's dancing is not just a, a kind of indulgence to be replaced by real digital labour, such as cybersecurity. I think there's an emergent sense that music is a system that needs sustenance, support and attention. And of course, uh, uh, your views on this will really depend on how important you think music is. And I, I've written a book called Why Music Matters. So uh, I guess, you know, I have a particular view on that. One important issue is that it's probably the case that consumers are going to need to pay more for music if musicians are going to thrive, just as we're probably going to need to pay more for clothes if uh, people working in the clothing industry are going to do better. Of course, there are issues about divisions of profit, pay out to uh, shareholders and so on. I think there's potential in the new system for more musicians to make it a living than ever before. The big problem remains surely inequality. Inequality, I mean, between the most successful musicians and the very long tail of less successful musicians. But is it possible to shift the superstar effects that seem so embedded in capitalism's way of rewarding talent and luck, because remember there's a huge amount of luck in success in these worlds, uh, in cultural production generally and in musical production. One, some people would want to, to do that, uh, but uh, in the shorter term, and uh, for now more pragmatically, some have been advocating user-centric payment systems, as they're known. These, uh, uh, under this system, um, uh, the financial financial reward for, uh, um, for streams is distributed according to the proportion of the individual user streams, not of the total streams. So to give that sim uh, version of that simplified example, if half of my streams, the streams I did on my Spotify account in September, were of tracks by artist X, say, Hans the Rapper, then a half of my subscription, once you've taken away the 30% retained by the streaming service goes to the rights holders of tracks by artist X. In the case of Chance the Rapper, as I've already said, he, he owns the rights to his own work. So that would be uh, quite a bit of money. And research that's been done on this has calculated that there may be some redistributive effects involved in this system compared with the pro rata system that I outlined earlier, i.e. the middle tier or the tier of artists below the superstar artists, the top percent or top 0.4 percent, or however you want to define the most successful tier, that that lesser tier, that lower tier, sorry, may benefit. Here's a, an interesting response from Spotify. They've declared an aim to support a top tier of one million artists who they want to enable to make a living. Out of me, it seems, ex it, it seems extremely unlikely that they will achieve that. And you can see that that's a public relations exercise. However, Music Business International um, has shown that um, there was an interesting shift between 2017 to 18, and this has continued actually into 2019. So in 2017, the top half million tracks in USA, in the USA, which corresponds really to the most successful lists, were streamed 14.6 times as much 
as all the other tracks on on Spotify put together. I think the, if I remember right, there are forty million tracks on on Spotify in the USA. Um, so you can see that concentration at the top end. But by 2018, that had gone down to being only 12.2 times as much as all the other tracks put together. Now, it seems impossible to explain that other than by reference to changes in Spotify's uh, uh, practices, including their recommendation algorithms. So that does reflect a, a, a seeming concern on the part of Spotify to shift income at least somewhat down the long tail. And it demonstrates, of course, the power of recommendation algorithms. Now, I, I, uh, I don't want to get into questions of solution and regulation too much. These are very difficult issues. And to be honest, I, um, the focus of my uh, talk today has been to um, clarify the problems and the questions we might be asking about those problems. So as part of on ongoing work, I'm trying to look at potential uh, solutions and what different stakeholders are saying about that. One uh, thing is for digital technologies alone, uh, as uh, was often claimed by um, digital utopians in the early century. Okay, I'm going to leave it there and end my show slideshow and stop sharing. Thank you very much, David. That was okay. fascinating. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, so I'd like to open up to Q&A now. So if any of our attendees have questions, um, you can either type your question in the Q&A box, which is in your options at the bottom of the Zoom page, or if you would prefer to um, read your question yourself, if you can use the raise hand option, um, if you open participants and click raise hand um, and I'll come to you. Um, so, yeah. So I'll go to uh, Xanthi Whitaker first, please, who has her hand up. Sorry, I see that was unintentional. Oh, OK, <laughs> okay uh, I'll go to uh, Stan Arot. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Hi, David. Um, yeah, that was fascinating. I'm just, okay. I'm just wondering. Um, I've been interviewing people about their, um, about how much attention they pay to algorithm to recommendations, and I'm not sure if it's people pretend that they pay less attention than they actually do. But are you are you absolutely convinced that Spotify making changes to uh, to recommendations would have the effect that you seem to be suggesting? Or is it just one factor among a lot? Of... Question, Stan. Um, but um, that shift, which um, Chip identified to the end, uh, um, you know, is really quite a significant shift to take place in one year. Um, so um, it, it does seem that on the surface, the most likely place to go for an explanation is what's happening within that system, you know, given these are streams on a particular platform. Of course, a more um, if we could get hold of the data, we, you know, and, and these issues are surrounded by opacity, um, then we might be able to make a comparison between whether there have been similar shifts on other streaming platforms. Um, and if there was a particular shift only on one platform, such as Spotify, you might then start to investigate uh, what shifts are being made. Of course, a lot of what is happening within the companies in terms of their um, um, what's happening with the recommendation algorithms is subject to commercial co confidentiality. Now, just on your uh, important point there about uh, people paying attention to recommendations, I, I think there might be some complexity there about what I mean by recommendation. I mean, often people, um, people don't, it, it's really what you're being exposed to. I think recommendation is a more general term for what, what appears on your screen. Um, 
rather than it necessarily saying you know recommended for you um it's um you know how the interface is organized and what content is is placed there um i could say more on that but perhaps that's enough for now thank you and um we'll go to uh will hunt who's asked um questions on the q a um, so Will asks, uh, firstly, what are the possibilities for musicians bypassing publishing rights by posting their music directly onto platforms such as YouTube and gaining revenue that way, like YouTubers do with their video content? Yeah, Will, um, yes, this is something that I was very much trying to uh, emphasise, that one of the key features of the new system uh, is that the emergence of a, a, a set of what are often called digital distributors uh, offering what are often called label services, uh, doing some of the things you can almost choose from a menu really, um, doing some of the things that uh, record labels and publishing companies do. Um, and many, many musicians use them. So it, it means, for example, you can get all your music uploaded very um, conveniently and easily on pretty much all the music streaming services. And you can get um, quite clear reports on how much it is being streamed, where and when. Um, and, and then there are other services such as publicity and marketing. So there, there are undoubtedly um those means of their use of those services and retaining their own rights which means that they are essentially bypassing the re record companies and, and the publishing companies they're not going to get much out of youtube um because youtube uh, the apart from the subscription services, a subscription version of YouTube music, of course, but the time um, YouTube uh, pays uh, very, very small amounts of money out to rights holders for, for various reasons. So um, I guess, you know, the, the in terms of, uh, uh, sorry, just to finish that, that thought, Esme, um, uh, you know, what I was saying, just to make it clear, is that that's an important, um, um, it's likely that th that change has led to some factors that aren't necessarily being considered when people say streaming is bad for musicians. We need to take that into account. So we've got lots of questions coming in. So there's another question from Will, but I'm going to go to somebody else first. So from Josh Murphy, and um, we have, how does this affect independent musicians um, in that a musician is not signed to a label? Um, and also, how do you feel about Spotify's new tool, which allows users to push their tracks in the algorithm for a lower royalty rate? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, well, how does it affect uh, independent musicians in a way um, that that previous answer is partially an answer to that question, isn't it? That that we now have a system where it's much more possible, it seems, for um, for musicians who are outside the world of record companies and uh, music publishers to be able to earn money from uh, the recordings and their songs. Of course, musicians have always been able to earn money from live performance. But as I was saying before, in the old system, prior to 2000, let's say, um, very few through that very narrow bottleneck into the world of record companies and music publishers. Um, now more are in that world as a result of digitalization, really. And music streaming is part of that. Now, that's not to say that they're necessarily getting enough. I guess a question for society, for us as people involved in thinking about these things, people who care about musicians is, you know, what, what would be 
a reasonable number of musicians for a society to sustain. Um, for what would be a reasonable number of musicians who could make a living out of music? Um, personally, I believe that it can and should be more. Um, but uh, one of the arguments I was hinting at in the talk was that the, the biggest problem of all is this skewing where attention and therefore um, money gets concentrated in the most, most successful artists, the top 0.4% or 1% or whatever you want to call it. Um, so the question becomes, how can you uh, allow the tier below that to prosper? I mean, a lot of people um, who have the music up on Spotify or other streaming services um, will be amateurs and, and they may not really be that interested in making a living out of music, but there are a hell of a lot of people who would like to make a living out of music and who were mm, short of that, of that threshold. And just um, tying into the, the second part of uh, well, Josh's second question, which also comes um, from Matt Dowson. Um, but how do you feel about um, Spotify offering lower royalty rates um, for bigger pushes in promotion um, and being pushed by the algorithm? Uh, 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 sorry, yes, I forgot to answer the second part of the question, okay. Ginta, um, which was about, and, and just to, to explain, uh, Spotify ha have announced that they are trialling a system where in return, in return for musicians, um, um, for rights holders, accepting uh, a lower um, uh, rate of return uh, from Spotify to the rights holder, um, you can get your uh, track placed higher on certain lists that are, are served up uh, usually as a result of uh, algorithmic recommendation. And so the, you know, one well-known example of that is a thing called Spotify Radio, whereas if, if, you, if you're playing one of your own playlists or, or something or anything, it will continue to play. That's what Spotify Radio means. Uh, and it will make a selection of what it thinks you might want to hear. And so the, this, this new system that's being trialed is that instead of that just being, you know, whatever they use to make that choice now, um, rights holders will be able to, as it were, purchase a place in such lists. Um, I think this is a worrying development. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, it's only going to favour the people at the top. Um, and if we're seeking greater equality, it, it's probably going to work against that unless there's something I've missed about it and whether this is only a trial and it does seem like there's been quite a backlash uh, against that idea so we'll see what happens okay so we only have five or six minutes left for questions and I have seven questions here um, so it's going to be quite quick fire David um, so I want to go to um, Martha Bloom who has her hand raised um, so if we could unmute Martha thank you Sorry, Martha, can you accept the unmute, please? So you can ask your question. Okay, right, we'll move on. Um, so we've got um, a question from Emily Coleman. Um, so really interesting talk. Um, you spoke a lot about how music revenues are split between artists, but how about the profiteering of the platform owners? I read reports that the CEO of Spotify is now a billionaire, richer than the Beatles and the Stones. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really, really important point, Emily. The, the, um, um, there's, there's no doubt that these platforms exist as part of um, a, a particular system of, of capitalism. Um, 
the, the platforms are tech companies. The rights owners are cultural industry companies. I think that's a, an important distinction to make. So uh, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, YouTube, they all arise out of uh, a particular form of business based on massive venture capital investment and huge rewards for the winners uh, in these winner-take-all, to use that term again. Uh, uh, of course, it's not unusual for uh, people running big companies to um, earn what I consider to be um, outrageously high, large amounts of money and for people further down the chain to earn too little. Uh, but that's certainly not distinctive to uh, music platforms, but it's certainly something that should be criticised, I think, as part of um, the general problems of contemporary capitalism, in my view. And a question from um, Steve Rolfe in the Q&A, who says it might be off topic, but I'm curious as to whether you think this has any discernible effects on the process of artistic production. Uh, does this make for better or worse music? Yes, that's, um, it's a separate question, but it's a really important question. And, and actually I'm working on a paper on this and have been for weeks and weeks and weeks and I can't seem to find the time between teaching and, and I've been to, to, to finish the damn thing. But uh, about the effects of streaming on musical culture, as opposed to on the welfare of, of musicians. Um, I mean, again, I think the debates are marked by some kind of oddities and misunderstandings in the same way that per stream rates keeps, you know, appearing all over the place. And I, as I explained, I think is, is the wrong way to think about it. Um, you hear things like um, uh, lots of reports about tracks getting shorter on music streaming services and how this reflects a kind of problem of attention spans and the you know so people put their anxieties about music onto onto streaming services um, um uh, 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 people complain about um the way in which lots of lists uh, uh, um, playlists are you know back ground to other uh, and that seems to me to be an odd thing because music has always served as background to other activities even if we love music you know we 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 play it while we're doing other things all the time so i think a lot of the criticisms that, that have been made haven't been very good actually um now is there a problem yeah yes i think there probably is but i think it needs to be looked at in a much broader historical context and to look at many, many different factors rather than just saying uh, music streaming has done this to music. I don't think music changes that quickly, actually. Oh, thanks. So I'm going to uh, Matthew Flynn um, in the Q&A says, although research indicates that for the major labels, user share versus pro rata models seem economically neutral. And given that from a PR perspective for the MSS users, share would seem to uh, seem to the lay user a fairer system of royalty distribution. Why do you think there has been such reluctance to transition to a subscriber brackets user share model? Yeah, um, th thanks, Matthew. Uh, I think among the objections that are, are coming from um, from the music streaming services themselves, and I should say that one pretty big or medium-sized streaming company below the big tech companies. Uh, Deezer, the French company, which has a big market share in France and Germany. Uh, Deezer want to introduce user-centric uh, and have, have, have done a lot of work on this and are ready to introduce it. Um, however, among the problems is that um, uh, if one company goes to user-centric, there's a danger that many of the rights holders will withdraw their catalog from arguably uh, the big rights holders stand to lose from a shift to user centric. Um, another objection that's been made is that the costs, uh, the data costs would be much greater because it's a much more complicated system. Deezer dispute that. They say it's actually not that difficult. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, 
above and beyond that, it's it's an it, it's hard. It may be that a crucial factor is the fear that some of the most prominent players in the industry fear that they are going to lose some market share. Thank you, David. So I'm going to we're going to we only have time for one or two more questions. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, Charlotte Durham. Um, to what extent do you think the integration of the ability to share music on social media, e.g. share a song directly from Spotify to Instagram stories, has impacted the way in which the streaming services work and monetization, if at all? Yeah, hi Charlotte. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I think one way to answer that is to refer to a kind of body of research that I, I haven't had time to mention as part of my presentation today, which concerns the, the labour that musicians uh, have to do in this new system. And, you know, I, I actually regret not mentioning this because I think it's very important. I've been talking about earnings. The talk was about earnings. But what I haven't discussed much is about the labour that needs to be done to get those earnings. And rightly, I think, a number of people have drawn attention to the increasing demands that are made on musicians at the same level as in, of income as they did previously. They have to do a tremendous amount of work in cultivating and maintaining relationships with their audiences. Uh, and a vast amount of that uh, happens through social media and uh, Nancy Bame, and my friend and, 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 and uh, as well colleague uh, is uh, someone who's written very. Um, okay, so um, I think what sadly is going to have to be our final question. So sorry if you if I haven't read yours out. And we're going to uh, Hannah Preston. Um, do you think the COVID pandemic will offer new opportunities to change this model in unexpected ways? For example, with McDonald's hosting a virtual music festival, could companies outside of media and culture have an impact? Hi, Hannah. Yeah, uh, well, I think, as I hinted at in the talk, that the, uh, the effects of the COVID pandemic on live music, which is simply you know, ripped out such an important part of many ordinary musicians' incomes, um, has already actually helped to spur a greater concentration on these issues of fairness and justice for, for musicians, which is really, I think, what, why we've now got a parliamentary inquiry, whether any change will come out of that, I don't know. Um, I mean, I wasn't aware of that McDonald's initiatives, initiative generally i'm um I, I guess i'm one of those people who worries that the intervention of sponsorship my uh friend and colleague leslie meyer has written brilliantly about this in her book popular music as promotion the intervention of sponsorship and branding in to music um, of, of the, the artistic freedom really of, of musicians so it, I wouldn't want a situation where in exchange for uh, a, a little bit more support and sponsorship from the you know the, the crumbs of the corporate tables um, we we saw um, we saw a diminution in, in the uh, creative autonomy of musicians Thank you, David, and thank you to everyone who posted questions. And I'm sorry that there were a few that we didn't get to, um, but I will take a note of them and pass them on to David um, after the event. So perhaps we'll thank have you. some sort of short blog to follow. Um, uh, just to say thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I've left some links in the chat there. Um, so this recording of the event will be available on the Digit website. Um, there's a link there. You'll also see a, a quick poll just coming up on your screen about your experience of the event. We'll be very grateful if you could give us some feedback since this is our first one. And next week, um, we'll be hosting uh, Dr. Francesca Sabande on um, the digital lives of black women in Britain, uh, which shows, uh, is sure to be fascinating and follows on from her recently published book. The link to that event is also in the chat. 
um, along with other resources on our website relating to the topic of David's talk and others to follow. And do follow us on Twitter um, at Digit um, for the latest updates on the Digit debate series and other events we have going on. If you can hang around for a couple of seconds, um, there will be an opportunity if you have um, more qualitative feedback on today's event, um, if you'd like to make any comment to us. Um, but in the meantime, um, thank you from myself, thank you to David, um, and we hope to see you all again for another Digit Debate very soon. Thanks a lot. <laughs>